done so. And today we have a, a special treat here. Uh, we have Weston Duke and, and Hannah are here uh, this morning, and some of you uh, might recognize him. It's been a few years, uh, but Weston, uh, really, actually, when I left seminary and came here, he left here and went to seminary. Um, Y'all lost that trade, but uh, we're glad to have him back here. Weston was uh, the intern at Rhodes uh, with RUF and is now the campus minister at MTSU in Murfreesboro. And so uh, anytime we get a chance to steal him away uh, from the Nashville region and, and bring him home to Memphis, we'd love to, to hear from him. So uh, please welcome Weston as he shares uh, the Lord's word with us. Well, as Ben said, my name is Weston Duke. I am the RUF campus minister at MTSU in Murfreesboro. And many, many moons ago, my wife Hannah and I were members here at Redeemer. And we're really thankful for our time here because it was a very formative time in our life. We were newly married. We had just graduated from college and we were in a new city, both figuring out new jobs. And this church loved us and supported us very well. And so we were, we were really thankful to be here and we really cherished our time. But as Ben said, uh, about the time that I moved up to St. Louis, he came down here. So I was up at Covenant Seminary for three years, graduated in May of 2018, and then moved to Murfreesboro to take on this new call, and I'm in, in my second year at MTSU. But we love being back in RUF, we love being back in Tennessee, and we love being back here with you all this morning. We're going to take a break from your sermon series on the book of John, and we're going to look at a psalm this morning, Psalm 139. I know this is a bit of a longer psalm, but we'll get through it all. So if you would now turn your attention with me towards God's word, it should be printed for you in your bulletin. This is a psalm of David. He writes, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I free from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shale, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. O oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. O oh, men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies." But search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are always thankful for your word, because you have not left us to wonder about who you are, but you have told us. You have told us how you are present and how you are working in our lives. And I pray now that your spirit would be with us, that you would give us understanding of your word. Would you give us ears to hear you? Would you give us eyes to see you? And you give us hearts to receive you? We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as was already referenced this morning, Ben and I went to the same seminary, Covenant Seminary in St. Louis. And 
in your first semester at Covenant, every student in our program takes this class with a very encouraging old man named Dr. Douglas. I'm sure Ben could tell you plenty of stories of Dr. Douglas if you were to ask him. And one of the things that Dr. Douglas has you do in this class is fill out an 80-page document full of these different assessments. So there are several different personality tests. There's a spiritual gifts assessment, an evangelism style assessment, a, a values inventory, talent inventory, skills inventory, questions about your emotional maturity, about your role models, about your ministry interests. I really think that if anyone came up with some sort of personal assessment in the last 20 years, Dr. Douglas just threw it on to this questionnaire. And the reason that he wanted us to have such a thorough analysis of ourselves is because he knew how it important it was for us as aspiring ministers to know ourselves before we go out and seek to help others. But this emphasis on knowing ourselves is not limited to those who are serving in vocational ministry. No, this emphasis on knowing ourselves has been around in the broader culture for as long as humanity has existed. Even 2,000 years ago, the Greek Aristotle, the Greek philosopher Aristotle said, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. And so this imperative to know thyself has echoed down through the centuries. And right now, you may see it being manifested in a variety of ways, whether that's using something like the strength finders or the disc assessment or the Myers-Briggs at work, or talking about the Enneagram with your friends. As our culture has become more therapeutically minded, we've gained a renewed interest in the importance of understanding our stories, of knowing what makes us tick, of understanding our, our patterns of thought and behavior. And I believe that all of this is really good. I believe that it's, it's helping us to gain greater self-awareness and, and greater personal and emotional health. But I also believe that there's a piece missing from all of that. Because the Bible wants us to believe that there is something more important than knowing ourselves. And that is being known. Specifically, being known by God. This theme is actually woven all throughout Scripture. Let me give you just a few examples from Paul's letters. In 1 Corinthians 8 9, he says, But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Then in 1 Corinthians 13, at the end of the famous love chapter, he says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. And again in Galatians 4, Paul writes, But now that you have come to know God, or rather, to be known by God. So drawing on such biblical data, the theologian J.I. Packer said, What matters supremely, therefore, is the fact that God knows me. I am graven on the palms of his hands. I am never out of his mind. And so here in Psalm 139, we find a psalm that celebrates how completely God knows us. And it not only celebrates that, but it teaches us what it's supposed to feel like for God to know us so completely. And so this morning, we're going to look at this psalm in two parts. We're going to look at the reality of God knowing us and the response to God knowing us. The reality and the response to God knowing us. So first, one of the things that's so wonderful about this psalm is that it paints a beautiful picture of the reality of God. And we're going to break down this reality using three fancy theological words that you learn in seminary. And you can use these words to either impress your Christian friends or sound like a jerk to your non-Christian friends. And these three words all start with the Latin prefix omni, which simply means all. So the first reality that we see about God is that he is omniscient, which means that he is all-knowing. This is really the theme of the whole psalm, but it takes special prominence in the first stanza. David says in verse 1, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. So here, David is using two opposite actions, sitting down and rising up, to represent the whole of our lives. He's saying that God knows everything that we do, and he means everything. 
in verse 3 when he says that you search out my path. That Hebrew word for search out is elsewhere used to refer to the sifting of grains of wheat from the useless chaff. And so here it means that even the things that we do that are unknown by others are brought to light by God. But he not only knows everything that we do outwardly, he knows everything that we are inwardly. In verse 2, he says, you discern my thoughts from afar. Even though God sits enthroned in heaven, you could say that he's in our heads. He knows what we're thinking and what we're feeling. Verse 4, he says, even before a word is on my tongue, you know it altogether. This reminds me of a quote from the great Michael Scott from the TV show The Office. He once said, sometimes I'll start a sentence and I don't even know where it's going. I just hope I find it along the way. Well, God knows where all of our sentences are going even before we start them. And that's because he knows what's going on inside of us even when it goes unexpressed. That's what it means for God to be omniscient, is that he knows everything about us, both inside and out. Well, the second reality that we see of God in this psalm is that he is omnipresent. In other words, he is everywhere. This is what David speaks about in the next stanza. He asks a rhetorical question in verse 7. He says, where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? And the implied answer is nowhere. And again, David uses opposite extremes to describe God's presence. He says that God is there above the earth in heaven, but he's also there in Sheol, which was the Old Testament term for the place of the dead, thought to be below the earth. The wings of the morning, in verse 9, refer to the eastern horizon where the sun would rise. And the uttermost parts of the sea, for David, referred to the far west beyond the Mediterranean Sea. And he's saying that God is everywhere in between. He's above and below the earth from horizon to horizon. And so even if David were to hide in darkness and no one else was able to tell where he was, God would know because he would still be there with him. So of course... God knows us because he is always with us. He is omnipresent in our lives. And the third reality that we see about God is that he is omnipotent. This means that he is all-powerful. Now, admittedly, this attribute is not as clear as the other two, but the next stanza in this this psalm still points us to that. It starts by telling us that God has the power to create life. Verse 13 speaks of God as the one who formed our inward parts and knitted us together in our mother's womb. And because we are made by God's creative power, he has known us even before we entered this world. That's what David's talking about in verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. But his power is not only seen in making us, but also in orchestrating all of our days. In verse 16, he says, In God's book were written the days that were formed for us, when yet there was none of them. This is not saying that God simply knows everything that's going to happen to us. God knows everything that's going to happen to us because he has formed our days for us. He has planned them out, and he is using his power to bring his purposes for us to fruition. We could say that he is the author of our whole lives from beginning to end. And I think the analogy of, the, of an author is actually a, a helpful one in thinking about the reality of how God knows us. Think about the relationship between a character in one of your favorite books and the author of that book. For the sake of example, I'll talk about the relationship between J.K. Rowling and Harry Potter. As you read Harry Potter, you quickly realize that Rowling is telling the story from an omniscient perspective. She knows everything about Harry. She knows everything that he does. She knows everything that he feels, like when he's riding high on Felix Felicis. She knows everything that he thinks, even when he is subject to the mind reading of Severus Snape. And Rowling is also omnipresent with Harry. She is there when Harry ascends to the tallest tower of Hogwarts and when he descends to the the depths of the Chamber of Secrets. She is there when he apparates and disapparates. She's there when he flies for the last time from number four Privet Drive and when he is there facing Voldemort alone. And of course, we all know Harry Potter at all because J.K. Rowling was the one who created him. 
So she is omnipotent in the world of Harry Potter, bringing to pass whatever she had planned for him. Well, that's the way that God knows us. As the all-knowing, everywhere present, all-powerful author of our lives. Now, if we were to, to stop and think about this, we could come up with a million different implications. But I want to touch on just two points of application before moving on to our next point. First, this means that God wants to be intimately involved with every facet of our lives. I hope that's been apparent thus far, but I say that so explicitly because we are prone to believing the lie that God somehow doesn't care about our lives, that he is distant or, or absent. And even as we hear about how he's omniscient and omnipresent and omnipotent, we could conclude that there's just a lot in our lives that's unimportant to him. He's got bigger fish to fry, right? Why would he be concerned with mundane details of our lives? But David won't let us draw that conclusion. David really puts on a clinic for us here in biblical application because he takes this reality of God's bigness and he makes it personal. Did you notice how often he used the first person singular? He said, I and me and my over and over and over. He's saying, God knows everything, so he knows everything about me. And he knows everything about you and wants to be a part of everything in your life. He was involved in the germination and replication of microscopic cells in your mother's womb. And if he was involved with that, then he wants to be involved with the fight that you had with your spouse or your roommate this week. He wants to be involved with the troubles you're having at work. He wants to be involved with the anxieties or the wants that you have for your kids. He wants to be involved with that hard decision you're having to make. He wants to be involved with what you do with your time now that your kids have left the house. He even wants to be involved with what you do on your phone. So the question for us is, will we let him in to all of these areas of our life? Or better yet, will we bring them to him? Because God is so big, there is nothing too small in our lives for him. But second, this means that God is the source of true self-knowledge. We talked earlier about how there's this emphasis on coming to learn ourselves. But if we truly want to know ourselves, then we have to know God. You may have read in the Reflections of the Bulletin, that the very first thing John Calvin says in his Institutes of the Christian Religion is that the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves is inextricably intertwined. They can't be separated. And so things like the Strength Finders or the Myers-Briggs or the Enneagram or even counseling are all great. I believe in them. But they are only tools for self-knowledge. God is the source of self-knowledge. And frankly, there's a lot about ourselves that we don't understand, right? Now, for example, for some reason, our society has decided that people act rationally, but we all know that's not true because our own behavior is confusing to us, let alone other people. I'm sure we can all think of a time in recent memory where we did something and then afterwards thought, what was I thinking? Why did I do that? But God knows what we were thinking. He knows the motives that drive us. God knows the very synapses in our brain that connect, leading us to perform an action. We also all have times where we can't really figure out what we're feeling. We either can't discern or we just completely ignore what's going on inside of us because sometimes that's just easier, right? But God knows our hearts, and he wants to help us see what's there. And there's also a lot in our the story of our lives that we can't figure out. Why did this thing over here happen? How did this relationship over here impact me? How did these two things connect? Well, God is the author of our lives, and so he knows how every detail is woven together. In fact, he's the one that's weaving them together for our good purposes. And so if we want to grow in self-knowledge, if we want the maturity that comes from understanding ourselves, then we have to look to God. He is the only one who can help us to truly know ourselves because he's the only one who truly knows us. That's the reality of God knowing us. 
And I wonder what your response is to that. This is our second point this morning, the response to God knowing us. Imagine with me for a moment that there is a book in which everything about you is written. Everything you've ever said, everything you've ever done, everything you've ever thought or felt, everything that's ever happened to you is written down in this book. With such personal information, you might want to keep such a book on you at all times. You might carry it around in your purse or your briefcase. Well, let's say one day you go and have lunch with an acquaintance. And it's one of those leisurely lunches where conversation is surprisingly easy. And so after an hour and a half has passed, you realize, oh, I've, I've got to get back to work or I've got to run some errands before I pick up the kids. And so you, you pay and you leave in a hurry. And as you're walking back out to your car, you hear your phone ring. And so you start rifling through your briefcase or your purse. And as you do, you realize the book's not there. In your hurry to pay and leave, you pulled the book out onto the table and left it there. And so you sprint back to the restaurant, but when you get there, you see that your acquaintance has picked up the book and started reading it. But not only that, the server, the busboy, and a small crowd of customers are also reading this book over the shoulder of your acquaintance. How do you feel in that moment? I don't have to guess. I, all, I know that we would all feel terrified. We would be mortified because there's a lot in our lives that we don't want people to know. There is a lot of which we are guilty, a lot of which we are ashamed, and we believe that if those things were exposed, that people would reject us. They would want nothing to do with us. And so even though we have this innate and God-given desire to be known, our natural response to being known so intimately is fear. But you know what's interesting? That's not David's response here. No, the first response we see from David is that he rejoices in it. He marvels and wonders at being known so intimately. Look with me at, at first, verse 6. He says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. God's knowledge of David overwhelms him. And in a good way, there is no hint of fear here. It may seem like in verse 7 that David is trying to get away from God, that he's trying to flee from his presence. But verse 10 tells us that God's omnipresence is comforting to him because it means that God is always there to guide him. God is always holding and supporting him with his hands. And then in verse 14, when David thinks about how intimately God is involved in our lives, he says, wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. And again in verse 17, he says, how precious to me are your thoughts. David cherishes God's exhaust exhaustive knowledge of him. He takes such delight in it that he could stay up all night thinking about it. That's what verse 18 means, that if David tried to count everything that God knows, that he would fall asleep trying. But when he awoke, God would still be there with him. So the big question for us is, if our natural response to being known is to be afraid, why is David's response to rejoice, to wonder in it? It's because David is convinced of God's love for him. David knows that God is committed to him no matter what. He knows, as he says in another psalm, that God's goodness and faithfulness will follow him all the days of his life. And so he doesn't fear being known. Yes, David knows that God is aware of all of those things that David regrets, that he is guilty of even the things that he despises about himself. But David also knows that God loves him perfectly anyway. And brothers and sisters, the same is true of us. God knows everything that we try to hide from others. He knows about that thing that makes you shudder when you simply think about it. He's actually known about that thing for all eternity because it was written in his book before you were born. He knows about that, and he loves you anyway. And that's the gospel. 
To be fully known and unloved is our greatest fear. But the gospel says that we are fully known and perfectly loved. And we can know that with even greater certainty than David did. Because now God has sealed his love for us with his own blood. Paul tells us in Romans 5, 8, that God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still trying to hide, Christ died for us. We're afraid that if others really knew us, then they would retreat. But God doesn't retreat. He actually moves closer. He sends his son to atone for everything that might keep us from him. And Jesus went to the cross knowing full well that he was paying for all of those things that you don't want known. And he did so because he loves you and he wants to redeem you from those things. And so we don't have to be afraid of being known. Like David, we can actually experience the joy of being fully known because we are perfectly loved by God. And do you know what happens when we start to experience that? We start to love God more. This is the second response that we see from David near the end of the psalm. So as we were reading through this morning, you may have gotten to verse 19 through 22 and said, what the heck, where did that come from? Because David is waxing eloquently about how wonderful it is that God knows us, and then all of a sudden he says, oh, that you would slay the wicked. Hello. What, what's going on here? What we see in these verses is a manifestation of David's love for and loyalty to God. Because God so knowingly loves David, David doesn't want to be associated with the wicked. He can't believe that anyone would speak ill against God. He can't believe that anyone would be opposed to God. And so he says, God, because you know me and you love me, I hate those who hate you. Your enemies are my enemies. But then he shifts gears one more time in verse 23. While he's looking out at those who don't love God, he seems to suddenly become aware that what's present in them is also present in him. He knows that he does not love God as he ought. And so just as God has searched him and known him, as in verse 1, he asks that God would continue searching and knowing him. He says, test me, see what's inside of me. Make known to me anything that grieves you and hurts others. Now, why would David invite this? We hate it when people point out our faults. We hate it when our kids point out our inconsistencies. We hate it when our spouses or our roommates tell us that we're wrong. It even stings when a close friend tells us that we're being selfish or dramatic or stuck up. So why does David invite that from God? Well, the last line of this psalm tells us it's because David wants to be led in the way everlasting. David wants to live in a way that pleases God, and he wants anything that would keep him from that to be rooted out of his life. David wants to love God wholeheartedly. He already loves him some, and he longs to love him more. So let me end with this this morning. I'm going to make the assumption that if you're here today, that you're interested in learning to love God more. Or at the very least, you're learning, you're interested in learning what that means and how exactly that happens. Well, it doesn't happen by trying to conjure up feelings of love for God. It also doesn't happen by working harder at loving God. Isn't that good news? No, this psalm teaches us that it happens when we embrace the feeling of being known and loved by God. It happens when we realize that we can't outrun God, and that's a good thing, because it means that we cannot outrun his love for us. When we recognize the reality that God knows everything about us and sent his son, Jesus, to die for us, then we'll respond like David does in this psalm. We'll rejoice in being known by God, and we'll long to love him with all that we are. Would you please pray with me?
Heavenly Father, we confess that we spend so much of our lives hiding. We hide from other people, and we also hide from you. Lord, but you know everything about us. You are always with us, and your power is always present in our lives. So I pray that we would come out of hiding, or that we would embrace the warmth and the healing power of your love. May we learn to rejoice in that, and would you use it to change our hearts so that we love you more. Search us, O oh God, and know our hearts. Try us and test our thoughts. See if there be any grievous way within us and lead us in the way everlasting. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.